Thank you. Uh, so I'm a, a .NET developer with a little bit of Knockout JS experience, um, a bit of uh, Neo4j graph database Ooh. background. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so the Codex is a, is a side project I have. Unfortunately, I didn't get paid for it. Um, basically, uh, it, 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 it looks at history. It's trying to build kind of an atlas of history. So looking at historical documents and translating them into a kind of semantic web-like structure so you can look at historical events and see you know, which people knew each other or, or try and identify what, you know, what people might have met or, or that kind of thing. So kind of like a social network of, of the past. So basically, yep, we use a graph model to encode these events. Um, we break them up into agents, artifacts, and events, and are linked by a, a common ontology, so a, a, a taxonomy. And the idea is to try and identify the unknown unknowns between um, you know, the documents we have to try and understand you know, the things that might not be obvious. So for example, this image here, uh, that shows a, a map of the events of uh, the lives of Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. So um, the, the bigger the circle indicates the, the more uh, activity that they had in those regions. And so we could run a slider over that and see whether they might have been in the same place at the same time. And the, uh, the cloud on the left here is um, what they call like an idea cloud rather than a word cloud. It takes this uh, ontology and um, it brings the common ancestors, the, the kind of higher level ideas to the top. So it kind of gives you like a semantic overview of your content. Uh, so I said it's implemented in Neo4j with uh, .NET and Knockout. So one problem we have though is that we've got all this text and you want to mine the text in, in various ways. Um, the question, you, you want to get that into a graph database. So the, the problem becomes how do you how do you um, map that from your, your data model to your text? Because ideally, you don't want to be you know, um, just having generic references to there's something in this page or not one in this document. You want to go directly to the part of the text that you're talking about. So my goal has been to enable you to, you know, like HTML has, you know, you've got tags, you can, you can style, you can, you can have links. But historical text is a bit more complicated in that you might have overlapping regions. You might have you know, uh, various people in ancient places. You know, events will cross you know, um, sentences. You might have or one scholar is inputting what their annotations for something, and another scholar is putting, inputting theirs. Can you store that without creating uh, horrendous HTML? So in HTML, XML, a range is essentially represented by an element. So you wrap something in a, a B tag for bold or, or A tag for a link. And that's fine if things are sequential, they're not going to overlap. Or if things are contained within each other, that's, all, that's, also, that's also fine. But essentially, HTML is a tree structure. Um, but a tree structure doesn't capture, you know, the, uh, doesn't capture the quality of a graph. You know, um, tree structure, you can't have any loops, there's no circuits, and you have to have a parent node. You know, a root node ultimately, whereas in graphs you don't have to have a root node. And you can have you know, circular references, you can have multiple parents. So I did a bit of digging into it and from what I could see in the, in the literature, the preferred solution was to essentially you separate your text and your annotation. So you have raw unformatted text, which has the benefit of being searchable. And you essentially create a, a, a collection of properties that represents a start index and end index and a bit of type information to say what this property does, whether it's a style like a bowl, whether it's a person, whether it's an event. And if it's an entity that, you know, if this property refers to um, an entity in a database, you might want to record that GUID as well. So properties that are not actually embedded in the text like HTML is are, are called standoff properties because they stand off from the text. So here's a, an example using um, content editable of how you know, this is a kind of a normal basic text uh, you know, uh, text editor in HTML. Um, you can see here we've got the, the bold and italics don't uh, overlap, so there's, there's no problem. In this case they do overlap, it's still, still okay. But when you get to this kind of case where you have um, you know, you've got the bold and the italics intersecting and you're starting to get kind of unreadable 
HTML. You can imagine if you had a very heavily annotated document, um, it would be very, you know, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be human readable. So, if you used uh, this content editable with, with HTML, uh, the editor would have to correctly disentangle your properties on your HTML elements, uh, which is possible but complicated. Otherwise, you would mark the start and end indexes, um, which in the usual case that I've seen online, uh, these texts are static and unchanging. So, there are solutions out there like Pelagios, which, or uh, uh, perhaps, um, uh, perhaps hypothesis to some degree, like you take you know, a static web page or text and you just simply mark what you want to annotate. But that wasn't very useful for me because I'm building this data set myself, I'm typing this information in, I make mistakes, I, I add things to it. So I wanted a, uh, a dynamic uh, property editor. So there are a couple of ways you can do it. I mean, you can, you can have these indexes which you update inside your properties, but you'd have to continually be updating these, you know, and the more you add, the, the more sluggish the system would become. So I had the idea instead of um, essentially work, working with pointers. So I, I take my text, I split it into um, an, an, an array of spans, one character per span, uh, span is an object, and my property can therefore refer to, to an object. I can actually have an, a, a, an object reference. So there's, there's a degree of uh, resiliency where if I'm adding text into that, that document, uh, because I'm dealing uh, solely with pointers, I don't have to worry about updating indexes, I don't have to worry about the system becoming slower in that sense. There are some challenges involved in making that happen. Um, one is a uh, more long-term challenge, which is scalability, and this, this is determined by the browser. Uh, because you're turning what is essentially a single uh, text node into you know, th you know, hundreds or thousands or millions of spans, uh, that is challenging for the browser to, to paint all that information. Um, and in some browsers, such as IE and Edge, even though the, uh, the text renders fine, I've found it to be unusable in terms of it's not a, you know, a, a dynamic uh, experience. There are, there are solutions out there, I believe, based on um, uh, strategies that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later. If you're taking this on and uh, you're not using the content editable functionality, you have to commit to handling all the in in input events yourself, the control keys, cutting and pasting, deletions, navigation within that. Uh, you have to be sure that your properties, um, if you're gonna delete something, that the pointers don't become null references, so you have to have a strategy in place for that. There are UI challenges. How do you visualize um, overlapping properties? Because the whole point is to allow multiple people to put you know, all their their annotations together. And ultimately, you want to build something which is, is fairly modular um, and can be extended. You can, you can add new annotation types. You can um, have means for looking up information to update your properties, for example, doing a, a search screen to the database. So these are the things I started with. So things to do if you want a slow property editor is work on span arrays rather than directly in the DOM uh, and copy everything to the DOM uh, iteratively, uh, constantly look up array ind indexes, and uh, don't do any anticipation of uh, uh, blocking the UI, just, just do everything in a synchronous way. So I found a few ways to improve things. Um, one is this uh, very useful uh, feature uh, of the document fragment. So basically, you're working with something like a a subset of the DOM that is not actually visible. Um, you, you can you know, add elements to it, you can, you can set it up as if you were working in the DOM, and then when you're ready, you simply insert that document fragment uh, directly into the DOM, and it gets um, incorporated to the page load very quickly. Now, I found that um, speeded up the load times um, significantly and made, co uh, made copy and paste virtually instant. Another thing you can do is um, because, as I said, you're managing this editor yourself, you have, to, you have to take care of things like updating the character position. So if you're moving your cursor around, you're adding and deleting, you've got to make sure that your cursor is in the right part of the text. Um, if you're moving one character at a time, that's not a problem. But if you're deleting a whole block of text, which you know, was fairly common, um, I found a very simple thing was to uh, do this kind of expensive update after you've actually deleted everything. 
um, and identify circumstances where UI updates can be asynchronous. So I'll show you in a second what the screen looks like, but uh, the editor has um, a section underneath which tells you where you are within um, the document, kind of like a you know, tiny MCE would tell you you're within a P tag or, or a you know, div. This tells you um, what property ranges you are within. Uh, these kind of updates, they don't need to run synchronously. They can run, you know, in fact, you want your cursor to be moving around. You want um, UI to, to treat that update asynchronously. Um, and also, I have to handle repainting my spans with the styles of properties that, that uh, cover that area, you know, underlines and italics and those, those kind of things. And those kind of things, don't, they don't have to happen instantly. Um, what's more important is capturing the text input, letting people type things in, delete things as fast as they can. Um, if there's a slight delay in the visual side of it, I think that's acceptable for the functionality. Uh, programmatically, where possible, um, try and traverse the mode list. So rather than thinking in terms of arrays and saying, say, index of and writing a map function to compare your current node, you know, your span to where, where you expect it to be, uh, you can use previous element sibling, next element sibling, or while loop. You can do a, you know, a, a bit of recursion, and um, in some circumstances, that's that's much quicker solution than than you know brute forcing the array. So this is what it looks like once the uh, some annotations are applied. And if you like, I can give you a bit of a demo. Um, if you want to watch it, I'll just transfer to that. Now this. So I'll just have to log, log in again. <clears throat> okay, so we have here a, a document uh, about uh, composer Franz Liszt and his childhood. So we have a color coded, we've got you know, some basic style annotations you would expect. You've got these more uh, complex ones which link to entities in the database. We have agents who are people, anything that can do something. Uh, we have uh, historical events, concepts, uh, annotations you know, um, themselves. So when you click this, you double click. These are other uh, uh, text documents, and you have another editor in the modal from which you can do the same thing. So um, once I figure out how to do, once I figure out how to do overlapping modals, uh, I'm going to have a full featured standoff property editor within the modal itself, so you can annotate your annotations, basically. Um, so how it works is, for example, if you wanted to annotate a concept like a prodigy, let's say you want that to be mapped in the system, you look up your concept, do a quick search, see if it comes up. Okay, so we can do a quick add. You can say a prodigy is a kind of Musician, and I'll just specify what kind of prodigy. Put a little friendly code, save and select. And I can do a very quick test of this by unbinding to JSON and rebinding. It seems to have been correct, so I can save that. It goes into Linear 4J graph database, and um, this is the uh, rendering of that uh, property um, model just as pure HTML, uh, just a read-only version with, with, with clickable links. Um, when you have these properties, uh, you can imagine with a, with a big document, and I'll show you how the editor works. So you can just type in anything here. see here that even though I inserted this text fairly rapidly, all the indexes, everything is still lined up. Um, you can do it in the middle. And nothing is out of alignment. You can delete and so forth. Um, you can delete whole chunks if you like. Uh, we can load larger documents like um, It's not in this particular database. 
another thing we can do is we can, we can assign layers to our properties. So, for example, if you took this text and you, you ran it through a natural language algorithm and it came back and gave you the, uh, the abstract syntax tree, uh, let's say you pass it on to a Google service and it told you, okay, for character, character 10 to character 20, this is this word, it's a verb or it's an adjective. That could be uh, a collection of properties that you might want to store in your system. And you would then give it a layer. You would say, well, this is from uh, Google NLP. And showing you could, you could elect to, to see that if you were a um, philologist or something, and uh, that, that was interesting to you, or if somebody else was using it who wasn't interested in that kind of semantic syntactical information, you could hide it and just choose what you wanted to work with. So where I'm intending to take this is um, while it, I find it works for small to medium scale documents, say you know a short story, something like that, maybe you know, 10, 20 pages doesn't seem to have any problems. Uh, there is a limit to the browser handling hundreds and thousands of spans in terms of um, repainting the screen. So I thought about it a bit, and it seemed to me to be similar to the problem that people have with infinite scroll components, where you're, you know, you're going back to the server, you're just appending one page after another to a certain point, you're going to have you know, hundreds of pages worth of you know, information in your DOM. And the way people have gotten around this, say in the mobile space, is that they define a viewport, they're going to say, well, essentially it's a pagination problem, so I'm only going to have on the screen maybe a thousand spans at any point in time. And at some point, I'm going to fetch more, whether that's through uh, intercepting the scroll event or uh, having some kind of paging mechanism, whatever. So there's a few things that I might look at for, for doing that. And ultimately, this is what you get out of it. So we had that text there. We can put style annotations, entity annotations. We can have other annotated documents referenced here as well. And this is what gets our output into, into Neo4j. And once it's in the Neo4j, uh, we can use the Cypher query language to start doing some graph queries. We can start looking at um, uh, the ontology of the people involved, or the, the activities or the concepts involved. And those queries can lead back to the text so we can fetch the information, dump it on the screen, everything's highlighted exactly where, where it occurred. Right, that's where I'm at at the moment. Surely you can think of so many places to apply this. Does this, does this mean even if we quit Facebook, you're going to come along in 200 years and add us all back? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh. Yep. So with um, so the first one of the first slides that you showed had a, a map and mm. like circles, yeah, um, heat zones. Um, yes. So would you like to see that? Yep, so how did you reach from uh, the agents, I'm guessing, or the layers yes. to mapping it on Google and the area of influence and the duration uh, historical figures spent? Okay, well this is kind of version one of the system where um, I didn't have the standoff property editor in place. I had uh, more embedded links to these things, but what I'd done, I'd entered a whole bunch of information from a, a Renaissance Florentine diary uh, put in a couple of decades worth of stuff, and then I started marking things up, saying, okay, well, these are the concepts involved, these are the people involved. If I knew that they were connected in some way, I would establish the relationships between them, friend of, patron of, whatever. And from, with that information, uh, this is a text representation of it, kind of you know, vaguely Twitter-like kind of idea. So these are the, uh, the this could be, ideally, it's primary source stuff, so someone's diary, a letter, something that you can look up, it's not an historian just making something up, it's actually something that's in the record. And then I've gone through and said, well, you know, Da Vinci's there, the Guild of St. Luke is there, and there are these concepts in there. Um, I've done the same for, for various people. Once you have that information in the system, you have, you know, you've got the date-time access to work with, you've got people, you've got places, you've got a geography, 
So what you get out of that is 